We're going to look at Matthew chapter 7. And this is a passage a lot of people have been confused. That's why we believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, what it means is that we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people and right time period. If you don't divide verses in such a manner, then you're going to combine everything together, think it applies to you, and come up with major, and I mean major, confusion. And one of the passages is Matthew chapter 7. Now, I'm going to give you two arguments. I'm going to give you the dispensational side, which is the easiest. And then I'm going to give you a non-dispensational side. So there are two arguments to this. Now, the dispensational argument concerning Matthew chapter 7 is that this passage does not apply to us. This is referring to the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom which is referring to the end times. Now look at Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to show you the problem here. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. By their fruits ye shall know them. Now that kind of scares you because how good are your fruits for the Lord, right? And it seems like that if your fruits are not good, you're going to go to hell. That's why verse 21, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's scary. So because if your fruits aren't good, then you're not qualified to go to heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, that's even worse. How well have you followed the will of God? See? Then you can go to heaven. Verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So these people thought they were saved. Because they've done a lot of things that a Christian would do. But God says they're not saved because their fruits are not that good. Now, that kind of scares you, right? That would scare you thinking that, well, Oh man, I must not be really saved then because my fruits aren't that good, even though I've done a lot of things for Jesus. Like these people who said they've done a lot of things for Jesus, and God says, no, you're actually not really saved because your fruits aren't good. So bad fruits are considered to be lost. Dispensationally, we can simply argue this. So Jesus is speaking at Matthew 7, right? Now, look, he finishes his whole sermon at verse 29. You notice that? Because look at chapter 8, verse 1. He's done talking, correct? Chapter 7 is part of the Sermon on the Mount chapter. Go all the way back to, I mean, look at the beginning of chapter 6 and look at the beginning of chapter 5. What's the context here? Notice that Jesus is speaking from Matthew 5 through 7, is he not? One whole sermon together. You notice that, right? This is called the famous Sermon on the Mount. Now, I showed you in my other dispensationalism video that the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, if you go by that for your salvation, you're going to hell. You are. Why? Because this does not apply to you. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because chapter 5 and 7, you know what he's preaching? Now, just go a few verses behind chapter 5. It's that simple. Look at verse 23, chapter 4 and verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. So notice that Jesus is preaching at Jewish synagogues. So this is a Jewish context. Jesus went about all where? Galilee. This is a Jewish region. So this is a Jewish gospel, the right group of people. And preaching the gospel, period. Is that what it says? The gospel, period? No, the gospel of the what? Kingdom. Is that Paul's gospel? Is that the gospel of Jesus Christ died, buried, and resurrected? No, it's the gospel of the kingdom. So this is a Jewish kingdom gospel that Jesus was preaching at. And healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease among the people. Uh, verse 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people. From where? Where does this sermon apply to? From people from where? Yep. Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. That's Jews. So the right group of people 
is Jews. The context, the time period and context is the Kingdom Gospel, Sermon on the Mount. Now this Kingdom Gospel, in case some of you don't know, is referring to an earthly kingdom. Earthly kingdom. Remember the Jews are looking for a Messiah to set up an earthly kingdom. That's what they've been looking for even now, right? So Jesus was preaching them that earthly kingdom because that's the Jewish Messiah they were looking for. See that? Because look at chapter 5. Look at some of the things he says right here. Chapter 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the what? Earth. See, this is earthly. Uh, look at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. They're seeing Him. See, face to face. And then uh, if you look at down here, look at the context. It's all something on earth. The Lord sets up a kingdom. Look at chapter 5 and verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the what? Council. Is that happening right now, then and there? No. There's some kind of kingdom set up here, you see? Some kind of government set up here that the Lord's going to ordain and do the ruling. Now think about this. This is so easy in dispensationalism. There, did this happen in the Old Testament? No, this is not. Did this happen in the church age today? No. Is this happening in the tribulation then? Well, obviously not. The Antichrist is ruling. What other time period then? See, millennium. That makes sense. Why? What's the only time period God sets up His kingdom on the earth? Millennium. That's the only time period. Revelation 20 says God rules on the earth. See? So, that's why we know this is referring to the millennium. So, that's the time period. The time period is going to be the millennium. So, for those of you who don't know the timeline, you've seen this countless times in my chart. I draw basically four main time periods. You see Old Testament. You see the church age here. And then you see the tribulation right here. And then you see the millennium right here. That's the only time period that makes sense with this. That's why it makes sense at Matthew 7. These people are brought up before what? God face to face. He has a judgment set up on the earth. He's crossing and canceling out who's worthy, who's not worthy, see, to enter into this kingdom in the millennium. So that's the easy argument. The easy argument is Matthew 7, 16 through 23 is not referring to us. It's referring to Jews. It's referring to the context of Jews and the time period is at the millennium. See, that's the easy way to handle it. Now, the non-dispensational way to handle it is this. Go to Matthew 7 again. The context is not referring to every single individual. Who's the context? Look at verse 15. 15. Who's this speaking about? Beware of who? False prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening woes. So here are these false prophets who hide themselves, pretending they're saved Christians like you. And Jesus Christ is showing, well, they're hiding themselves, so how can you tell? Verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. See that? So they act Christian, they talk Christian, they smile like Joel Osteen, right? They smile like Billy Graham, right? So they act like these guys that seem and talk like Christian, but by your fruits, by their fruits at verse 16, you can tell if the person is not saved. See that? That's why they're hewn down and cast into the fire. So you don't have to worry about my, yourself. It's referring to false prophets. That's the context. Now the question is this, though. The question is, well, then that means that if let's say that I believe salvation is by faith alone, and Billy Graham did that, okay? I, I actually can lean toward that. I am open to the possibility Billy Graham is a saved person who received Christ for his salvation. I'm also open to the fact that he's probably lost, okay? But the point is this. I'm just giving you an example. Let's say that I'm a pastor. I got saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's not my works whatsoever. What if I start to sin and backslide and start to give bad fruit? See, what if I become the false heretical pastor? See, does that mean I'm going to burn in hell then? 
So that's the problem then, right? Well, here's the simple answer. The simple answer is look at verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So that's the condition, right, to go to heaven? Well, that's more simple than you think. What is the will of God for you to go to heaven? To do good works or to receive Christ? To receive Christ, see? So there's your simple answer. But, look at this. Look at verse 22. What are they trusting in for their salvation, these false prophets? Is it them believing in Christ for salvation or their works? Look at verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done what? Many wonderful what? Works. So the context is it's not just false pastors, okay? There might be pastors who mess up and they are saved because they believe in Christ for salvation. But it's referring to false pastors who trust in works. See that? So there's a non-dispensational way to answer it. The context is referring to false pastors who trust in works for their salvation. So that's what Matthew 7, verse 16 through 23 is referring to. So you can use that as a non-dispensational argument. If you don't want to go through that and you want to make it very easy for yourself, the easy way is to just simply say, yeah, it's not applying to us. It's for Jews in the millennium. That's it. And then all you have to do is jump to chapter 4. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Jews, right? Galilee, Decapolis, all Jordan, Judea. What's he preaching? The gospel of the what? Kingdom. See? So all you have to show them is Matthew 4, and then you can finish that way too. So this is how you handle this passage. This has been one of the stumbling blocks that people use to doubt their salvation, to make them trust in good works for salvation. Not only that, even lordship salvationists like Ray Comfort, Paul Washer, John MacArthur, these, uh, the Wretched Channel, Todd Friel, these guys would use this verse to question a Christian's salvation because their fruits are not that good. But you can debunk them by showing that this is referring to what? Dispensationalism solves everything. These guys are not dispensational salvationists. If you believe in dispensational salvation, you got an answer for all the verses that they'll pull up where a Christian will have to do some kind of work for salvation. That's the easy way to do it. But if you want to do a non-dispensational way, you can tell them this. They went to hell not because... Uh, that they had to continually show the works, but rather because they were trusting in their works. That's why they went to hell. So you can do that too.